Okay, hey there, and uh, welcome back. I hope everyone is doing well. Um, we've kind of shifted our, um, usually I was releasing these modules or making them available on Canvas on Wednesdays, um, but since we have the wellness days, I'm going to try to build those in so the days on which um, these become available on Canvas are probably going to shift uh, a day or two as we move through the semester and have a couple more of those wellness days. So <clears throat> they're going to be on Thursdays now, and then they might switch to Fridays, and we'll, we'll figure that out as we go. But you'll always have at least one week um, to, to work your way through these. Uh, okay, so um, this week we were talking about um, speciation and extinction. And if you remember last week, I mentioned that the three, sort of the three fundamental um, processes in biogeography are immigration, evolution, and extinction. And you may think that evolution and extinction are sort of two uh, completely different things, but in reality, they're, they're usually two different sides of the same coin. So we're going to talk about them uh, a little bit in conjunction um, in this module, uh, or at least not necessarily at the same time, but we're going to cover a little bit of both of them and then dive into probably them individually um, um, more so later on. And uh, I think, you know, I think when most people um, think of evolution and extinction, they're usually thinking of it on some sort of time scale or temporal scale. You know, things evolve over time and you think of evolution over the history of the earth and, you know, how certain species showed up and, you know, how they went extinct over time. Um, but really, there's there's a really strong spatial component to this as well. Uh, that we'll get into in this module. And honestly, it, it, um, thinking about things, some of the spatial patterns are really what formed the foundation of our current understanding um, of evolution. So it wasn't, it, this isn't really a new thing that we're realizing, like the spatial foundations of this go all the way back to the, the formation of the theory of evolution and um, was known by Darwin and, and Alfred, uh, Alfred Russell Wallace, if you're familiar with him. If not, he's, uh, he's one of the early guys uh, along with Darwin. They, they sort of had came up with these ideas of natural selection and evolution kind of independently around the same time. Um, but, but the spatial aspects of this were very much uh, in their thinking. Uh, and uh, another concept I want to introduce, uh, there's a few things I want to sort of introduce before we really get into it. Uh, one of these is cohesion, and it's uh, it's kind of an abstract concept. Um, the formal definition is sort of the, uh, it's the integrity of a species that is maintained uh, by an array of genetic and ecological mechanisms. And it's kind of hard, I think, to wrap your head around what the integrity of a species really means. Um, the way I kind of think of this is like the it's the glue that holds a species in place in, in terms of whether it exists or whether it's stable or whether it's um, changing into a new species or um, you know the population's in decline and it may be uh, on the verge of going extinct. The integrity is sort of um, the mechanisms that, that um, sort of stabilize a species and it's not always necessarily the case. I mean um, species don't always have integrity or cohesion. Sometimes they're uh, sometimes they're evolving into new species, and sometimes they're going extinct. So we'll we'll talk about some of that. But it's sort of the you know the genetic um, interchange of genetic material and how organisms interact with their environment and, and all those things um, sort of combined um, represent this concept of cohesion. Uh, and, and one other thing I want to mention here before we get started uh, into the sort of meat of it is that species are uh, ephemeral. And what I mean by that is that they are, um, species are short lived. So if, <clears throat> if we look back throughout history, um, most species that have existed have actually gone extinct. And if the fossil record has told us anything, it's that um, most species that exist now, if not all species, um, will go extinct. I mean, the vast, vast majority of species that, that exist now or have ever existed are going to go extinct, if not 100% of them. And so species um, from, from a geological um, time scale or perspective, um, they are ephemeral. They're not around for very long. Um, on long-term time scales. You know, we're talking about really long time scales, so the time that any one species tends to exist is 
is short-lived. So you basically you have two, uh, I don't want to say options, but two, um, I don't know what the right word is, two outcomes, two potential outcomes. If you're a species, you either go extinct or you evolve into a new species over time. That's pretty much the, the evolutionary fate of every species that has ever existed and will ever exist. Okay, so let's um, let's sort of uh, get into this and talk a little bit about, you know, what is a species in the first place? And it turns out this is actually, uh, it sounds like a basic thing. Um, we should be able to define what a species is, um, but uh, this is, there's been a lot of debate over this uh, over decades um, in biology, in evolutionary biology, and it's actually a really difficult question to answer. Um, just to sort of set the stage, um, it, it kind of, it, it gets at, some of it is, is like how is genetic information um, being exchanged and there's differences in those patterns. So genetic lineages, um, we can say genetic lineages exchange genetic material in organisms that reproduce sexually, um, but they remain extinct in organisms that do so asexually. And so what that sort of means is like if you were to follow, you know, if we were to pick so let's pick this individual in this network of individuals for uh, organisms that reproduce sexually. And this is sort of, I don't know, we're, these are hypotheticals. So we're just looking at this uh, individual. Um, we'll say this is a female. In this network, you can kind of see how the offspring um, it, it, from this, from this uh, particular individual and, and all of the ancestors, um, or I guess all of the offspring from this ancestor, are, are interrelated to one another and they're sharing, you can sort of see, I think the colors are, are meant to represent, um, you know, the, the amount of genetic information that's getting passed on. So genetic information is being exchanged and lineages are, are preserved, but also interchanging or exchanging genetic information. And, and what you end up with is this net-like or mesh-like network in organisms that reproduce sexually. Um, in organisms that reproduce asexually, you get different, uh, a different sort of pattern, and so they're, they're not exchanging genetic information, and so the, the lineages remain pretty much distinct. You know, the, this individual, uh, I guess we probably start down here, um, this individual's lineage is distinct from this individual's lineage, which is distinct from this one and this one, and they're distinct, they're not interchanging, whereas, you know, here, um, you know, this individual and this individual's lineages, it's only a couple generations before those are getting interchanged. And so uh, part of it has to do with how is genetic information getting exchanged um, throughout this network. And if we want to, you know, we can kind of zoom out and we can say, what are the relationships um, between individuals and what are the relationships between species? And that can sort of shed some light on uh, on evolutionary timescales. And so phylogenetic relationships between species are similar to relationships between individuals. So, so the relationships between the species are similar to the relationships between the individuals. And if we're talking about between species, where that's, that's considered phylogenetic. If you're talking about between individuals, then the term is tocogenetic. Not super important that you remember those, um, but I think conceptually, that's important. And so we, we can see that, okay, let's assume this is a sexually reproducing organism and you can see how, um, you know, genetic information is going to go from one individual to its offspring to that in individual's offspring and, and so forth. Similar sort of things happen with species where you have, um, a, a parent or ancestor species, which might give rise to two, um, two subsequent um, species through evolution, but genetic information is going to be passed on um, from that ancestor to those different um, species. And so you get sort of like, you know, this is one species and this is one species and maybe this is the parent species. Uh, if you zoomed out, you know, it would look something like this and the network um, looks kind of similar. So you get these similar sort of patterns. And I think it's probably good to sort of back up for a minute and say, you know, what, what exactly are we talking about here? Um, we're getting into a branch of, of science called systematics, and systematics has two sort of sub-disciplines. Uh, one is taxonomy, which is sort of the naming and classification of organisms based on their characteristics. Uh, and the other um, 
subdiscipline would be phylogenetics, which is um, sort of un, um, establishing the evolutionary uh, and genetic um, relationships among these things that you've classified and sort of putting them on um, kind of a time scale and quantifying the relationships to one another. Um, so that's some of what we're getting into a, a little bit here. And they're not really, none of this is really new uh, ideas. Um, Darwin, in, fa in fact, Darwin published this figure, and I won't really get into this, but this is a figure from um, The Origin of Species. And he had this view that species were um, sort of branches in the lines of descent. So instead of a species being like an endpoint um, or like a node, like a, like a stationary thing, species were sort of the vehicle of, of change. Um, throughout um, evolutionary time and, and throughout sort of the, the overall tree of life, I guess, if you wanted to zoom out as far as possible. Um, but you may, uh, you may notice that we, I haven't really given you a definition yet for what uh, a species is exactly. And the, the main reason for that is we don't really know. Um, it, that may be surprising. I think people are usually surprised um, when I, you know, when I get to this point in the course and say you know, we've been talking about species this whole time and we don't really know what they are. Um, but it's actually really difficult um, to determine exactly what a species is. You know, if you're trying to say, you know, what's the difference between an elephant and a mouse? You know, that's obviously really easy. Um, but what about different types of elephants and different types of, of mice? Uh, it gets a little bit tricky and say, where are you going to draw the line? And so we use, we have all these different um, definitions and you're probably familiar with some of them. Like the biological species concept is like, uh, you know, can, can these uh, organisms reproduce with each other and do they do that naturally in their populations or in their, in their natural populations? Um, I think that's the one that people, most people fall back to and say that's the, the one that people are familiar with, um, but it has a lot of problems. It doesn't work in a lot of situations, like what do you do with um, organisms that form hybrids in between different species? Are those actually different species or not? Is the hybrid its own species? Um, there's things that can reproduce asexually under certain conditions. Certain species of sharks can do this. Um, there's, there's hermaphroditic species. There's all sorts of weird things that can happen here. Um, and so things that don't necessarily fit and you can say the same thing and say, let's get genetic about it and say, it's the, it's about the fertilization system and the chromosomes and, and how that happens. And, but there's weird things that happen there too. Um, and so there's all these other ones, there's things that are based on the morphology, whether you're talking about the phylogenetic or the genealogic component, um, or even going back to the cohesion that we talked about. Um, and even like the morphological one is still um, still in use, and this is sort of the classical one with going back to Linnaeus, which you know we'll talk about that a little bit. But um, you know what are the characteristics that organisms have that you can see and measure? Um, but it doesn't really matter. None of these actually fit, um, or none of them work 100% of the time, and you get weird scenarios. And that has sort of led to this um, theoretical conceptualization of what a species is. And this definition, I'll read this one, where it's a species is an entity composed of organisms that maintains its identity through, or sorry, from uh, other such entities through uh, time and over space, and that it has its own independent evolutionary fate and historical tendencies. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't necessarily know what that means. <laughs> I mean, I think you can understand what it means, um, but it's a little abstract and it's a little um, sort of uh, esoteric. Like you can't really take this and apply it to anything. Um, it's probably theoretically correct. And I think this is, if you were going to say, what is a species in its essence, um, this is what it is. Um, but none of these are things like, you can't measure any of these things. You can't observe any of these things. So you can't use this definition um, to, to tell the difference or to you can apply it to anything. And so that's why we still have these. Um, we still use these in practical settings, even though we know, um, you know, biologists are well aware that not any one of these is going to work 100 percent of the time. Um, the, the key is that is it telling you um, useful information and can we combine some of these and, and get at something that might uh, be as close to accurate as we can possibly get. 
And that's kind of how science operates um, as a whole. So the, the key takeaway here is we don't actually know what a species is. We have a lot of different definitions for it. None of them work all the time, unless you want to use this one. Um, but that doesn't really work in a practical setting at all. Um, so um, it, it's, it just depends is sort of the short answer there. Okay, so I'm going to finish up this, this video. Um, there's a reading here uh, that goes into this in a little bit more detail, and I think in a little bit uh, with some good examples and an easier, a little bit easier to understand. So uh, get to that reading, work your way through that, and uh, keep working your way through the module. I will see you in the next video.